News Talk ZB and the New Zealand Herald present Cooking the Books with Francis Cook, demystifying your finances. Welcome to Cooking the Books. I'm Francis Cook. January has a fun nickname in the lawyer world, splitting season. After being cooped up with each other through the holidays, the stress of Christmas and family expectations, it turns out a bunch of us decide we've had enough. But of course, like everything else in the last 12 months, COVID-19 is making it worse. Plenty of lawyers have been speaking out, saying there's an increase in demand for their services, especially after the lockdowns and stress of this year. Now, divorce is obviously very tough, and it's also one of the worst things you can do to your money. Even worse is when, through the course of the relationship, one person has simply trusted the other to take care of the financials. When it comes to the split, you're suddenly on the back foot. So, how do you handle it to come through this as best you can? News Talk ZB presents Cooking the Books with Francis Cook, boosting your business confidence. I'm joined now by Bridget Jackson from Equal Access. Now, when people get divorced, there's obviously a lot of heightened emotion, and you're trying to make pretty big money decisions amongst that. So, what are some of the main problems that you see when people come to you? One of the main issues that I see time and time again um, with being at the coalface is that predominantly women who come and see me, there's about 70% women who come and see me, 30% men, is they have no idea about finances. So there is a financial illiteracy there. Um, they've been in a marriage or a de facto relationship and they haven't managed the money. They've been looking after the children. That's been their main focus. And um, yeah, that is a real issue for, for women. Uh, I would say, you know, 80% of the women that I see, that is an issue for them. Another issue that I see is that there's a huge difficulty in people being able to actually obtain information about the shared marital assets. Um, that's extremely, can be extremely difficult, particularly if one partner, woman or man, um, has been in charge of the uh, finances. Uh, and and knows exactly you know what everything's worth, and the other partner has has not got as much of an idea as the other partner has, and that goes hand in hand with high conflict personalities, um, people um, high net worth. The more money you want, um, the more money that you do have as a family can be an issue as well, which can create greater conflict between partners. So you know. If money is being hidden or people have decided that they're not going to actually be open about the financial situation, that potentially can lead to undertaking discovery through the court system, which is very time consuming, take, has a huge emotional toll. Uh, and um, it's very expensive. Mm. And of course, like everything else in the last 12 months, COVID-19 has impacted this, hasn't it? Oh, COVID uh, has been massive um, in China. Uh, for example, uh, the rates have gone up 38%, and there's a lot of reasons for that. So there's what I'd like to call them as the marital marital irritants. So um, there's not enough not enough money. You know, there's too much stress. There's expectations of people in terms of their roles in the household with with children and with um, housework, for example. In New Zealand, it's gone up 25%. Uh, over this period and yeah, mental health has increased massively uh, at least um, I was talking to my father the other day he said it's gone up 70 percent in Melbourne mm -hmm. mental health over the COVID period people losing jobs uh, people being restructured people having to work from home not able to go back into their office having to homeschool their children if the relationship already hasn't has been on a, a rocky road, uh, then that has escalated the issues with the COVID. Mm. And I think the thing is, um, obviously these stresses are awful and a lot of people crack under these sorts of stresses. If you are in the relationship and still hoping to keep it going, obviously, I think there's always a place for you. You must trust your partner, of course. But um, yes. that I think is different from blind trust that you even if the relationship is perfectly healthy, it's good to know where everything is. So if someone is still in a relationship at the moment, I mean, are there things that you should be doing as just a part of keeping the money conversation healthy and equal before anything goes wrong? 
Oh, absolutely. I think, you know, I think it's really important actually at the outset of your relationship that you actually sit down together and so we're equal partners in this relationship. And in terms of money, you know, we, what, we, we, we're in this together. You know, we, our relationship is actually a, a living entity. It's not the two of us coexisting as individuals. We're working together as one. So what we need to do is we need to sit down and we need to go through all of our financials and actually be really transparent with each other. Uh, and people have different ways of, of, I suppose, money personalities of dealing with money. Some people are savers and some people are spenders, etc. So I think if at the outset you're able to establish what is the personality of each um, partner in the relationship and how are we going to best manage that for our situation. If you're a spender, then let's set aside a budget for you that you're able to use to spend on whatever you want on a weekly basis or a monthly basis. And if you are a diehard saver, um, you know, how can we meet in the middle? How can we meet in the middle and ensure that we are both on the same page with our finances going forward? I think that's really, really important. Establishing these ground rules and focusing on the different areas of your life, including financial, right at the beginning sets the scene for a really good relationship moving forward. Because when you're talking about money, you're talking about so many other important things that you do need to have conversations about. And of course, because they're important, it can be a little more fraught, but you still have to talk about it. I mean, just ignoring it and burying your head in the sand and acting like your relationship can't handle it. I mean, that's not the biggest vote of confidence in your relationship. I think the best thing you can do is gently start having these conversations yeah. but of course um one of the things that you will do is often be talking to people as a divorce coach when things have gone wrong so if things have gone wrong and someone is coming to you and saying look we just didn't talk about money and i i don't know where it is and i don't know what's gone on there where do you start with that well, it's really huge, actually. Um, so what you need to do in the first instance is one of the first bits of homework that I give them is you need to go home and you need to find you know as much financial information as you can. If you've got an amicable relationship with your soon-to-be ex-partner, then you need to sit down and have a conversation about that. And I can help them. I help them write a script in relation to that as well. And you know, say, so look, we want to be moving forward individually, uh, but we want to be amicable for the sake of ourselves and obviously for the sake of, ch of their children if they're involved. So what actually what actually is in our pot? What is our SMA or our shared marital assets? And if that doesn't work, um, you know, unfortunately lawyers are going to have to get involved and write to the other side's legal counsel and ask them to actually uh, provide the information that is needed because if the if you don't know what you owe and what you own in its entirety, you can't actually. No lawyer is going to sign off on your settlement agreement. All right. So if that doesn't work, then you're staring down the barrel of having to go to court for discovery of actually what is in that pot, and that can be very time consuming and. Unnecessary. So, if in the first instance you can be amicable and can work through that together and actually make sure that you both get what you deserve, that is the best way to do it. Because I say to my clients, you don't want to be looking ahead. You know, what, what you want to, I, I say to them, in five years' time, how do you want to look back and go, do you want to think, oh, well, yeah, I got everything I wanted and I shafted him or her? Or do you want to think, well, I actually acted in the best interest of myself, of my ex-spouse and my children, and I can live with myself moving forward. Mm. It's an important conversation that I have. And that's not just in relation to money, but that's in relation to all the facets as you go through the divorce and process, uh, divorce and separation process. Yeah, and I think that's a really good point because on, it's notorious, isn't it, that two people go into divorce and neither come out with money, it's all gone to the lawyers. I mean, yeah. I think that when people break up, um, maybe this is going to get a little philosophical, but I genuinely feel that like every person has a dark side and in a relationship breakup is when that dark side often comes to the fore because there are so many hurt emotions, people are not their best selves, they're for the most part, their worst selves. So is is that sort of what you can do to bring some of those emotions down and hopefully try to have a conversation, try to get things back on a better footing is, is appealing 
to their better nature again? Is that one of the things you do? Oh, absolutely. But I tell you, which is really positive from my point of view, is that I'm now doing a lot of informal mediations with couples who actually, we don't want to fight with, you know, through the court system or through the lawyers. We just want to come with come to you and work it out amicably. And I've had a case this week, actually, where um, I had the ex-husband come and he said, I really want to work with you. We've been working together for a few days. And he said, I'm going to get my ex-wife to come and work with you too. And we're going to sit down and we're going to sort this out together and we don't need anyone else involved. And, you know, I really want to, congr I said to him, I really want to congratulate you for, um, you know, it was only a matter of a couple of weeks ago that the relationship broke up. I said, you've really got to pat yourself on the back and be commended for, you know, the attitude and the behaviour that you're undertaking in relation to what's just happened. Um, you know, it, it's fantastic. Um, I'm really, really heartened by the number of people who are turning around and now deciding to um, do this. And the opposite, there are also an increase in the high conflict um, divorces, unfortunately. Um, it's predominantly the women who are left bled dry and having to undertake discovery to get information around their shared marital assets. And that's really difficult. You know, people are having to, women are having to camp down with friends and, you know, aren't able to access any of the money because accounts have been frozen and all sorts of things, which just, you know, it's really, really sad. Um, the more money you have, the more high conflict it is. And it all, when it comes to money, that's when, when it comes to discussing the shared marital assets, that's when things go to custard. It's the money or the children or both. Mm. Okay, so when you're in one of those high conflict situations and you're still trying to resolve it, what are some of the methods that you use to cool it down a little and try to get people back on the same page? Okay, well, it's very important for, um, in, in the first instance, that you don't actually tell someone that they've got a high conflict personality. You know, you don't say you're a narcissist or you're a borderline personality. <laughs> it's not that. That is Why wouldn't that be helpful? <laughs> That is not going to get you very far. Uh, if you're trying to undertake a mediation uh, with someone in relation to that, then that's not going to happen. I'm actually just um, working at the moment with Bill Eady, who's the international, renowned international expert, uh, working on high conflict mediations. What's the new way of mediating? So that's been um, so that's been really interesting. I'm in the middle of that now. So one of the biggest things is that uh, proposals. People with personality disorders love proposals. Okay, so you, if there's, for example, if there's an issue over, um, you know, let's say there's an issue with the custody of the children, and you know, I would rather have them at four o'clock and not six o'clock on a Sunday. You know, it, it gets down to these small little minute bits of detail, as you can imagine. And um, so it's either a yes or a no, or it's off a think about it. That's going to be the answer that's going to come through. And obviously a yes is great. And I'll think about it as really great too, because that means they haven't said no. So you give them a bit of time to, okay, we're going to think about this issue and we come back to it. And if they come back and say, well, that's a no, then you're okay. What is your solution? What's your proposal that you're willing to put forward um, that's going to allow us to move, you know, move in a positive direction with this issue in terms of four o'clock or six o'clock on a Sunday in relation to the children? So there's a lot of different strategies there that you can employ. And, you know, it's very important to actually be positive as well. Um, if, if, you can, if you can say something nice about somebody, that will, uh, that's really important because you've got to actually be calm and you've got to be collected and assertive, not passive and not aggressive. It's very important to be assertive. Mm -hmm. So calm, confident, and trying to model the behavior you would like to see. Is that sort of the idea? Absolutely. And also at the start of a mediation, when you're um, working with high conflict personalities, you set down the ground rules. You know, mm. During this session, we are going to be kind and respectful to each other. We are going to allow each other to talk and not interrupt. And if we're not able to do that, we're going to have to end up you know, moving out of the room for a while or 
actually we're going to have to stop this mediation and, and, and potentially have to undertake it again at some other stage. So I do that whether they're amicable or whether they're high conflict. I actually always start a mediation, I do them informally as I said, with thinking that everybody in the room, well the ex-partners in the room are potentially have potentially got high conflict personalities. Um, that's the that, that's a really good way of approaching it. Mm, that's really interesting. Okay, so if someone has um, not paid much attention to their finances, and it's it's a notorious thing. There's so much research that um, again, particularly women, often show trust in their partner by just handing over control of the money and. Again, I understand it, and you're in a relationship because you trust someone, that's good, but trust is different from blind trust, and you should still know what's going on. Um, or the very basic minimum, from my point of view, is to have some financial literacy so that even if you're not across every day to day, which I still think you should, but mm -hmm. even if you're not, um, to have an idea of how that sort of thing works. I mean, does that help when people come to these situations? Oh, um, absolutely. I mean, I'm working with an external consultant at the moment, actually developing a financial literacy pa package, particularly for women, because with working at the coalface, you know, I see this time and time again, and there are very few women who actually have managed the finances. You know, um, some have managed a few household bills, but they would have no idea um, in terms of even how much the mortgage is. Mm. Um, I don't even know how much the outgoings are every month, or he just pays everything. I've got a supplementary credit card. He just transfers money into my account. These are the things that I hear. And they are terrified of how they're going to move forward financially as a single person and the fundamental, you know, the mistakes that you can make with finances is very easy to do. A lot of women too just go and spend money. They've got high emotions and, you know, they, they're, they're sort of doggy paddling around because their, new, their old relationships ended and then and their new beginning hasn't started spending money to make themselves feel better. It's quite a common issue. So really what they need to do is they need to reorganise their finances without obviously their ex-partner being involved. And that starts with obviously doing a shared marital asset spreadsheet. Uh, but this is before you sign the settlement agreement, obviously. I've, I've got a spreadsheet which I give to all of my clients. Right, first thing is the finances. We need to know every single thing that you own and you owe. Uh, so we fill that out. We get as much information as we possibly can. Then we need to start working through, uh, you know, the uh, setting up a, a bank account, your own bank account at a separate bank um, to move away from the joint accounts. You need to check what are the automatic payments, the direct debits, uh, debt payments, because you, you know you're going to have your credit report, your credit rating is really important, and you've got to ensure that all of those things don't get left by the sideline, particularly if people are in dispute, and then one decides not to pay the mortgage, and then the rates don't get paid, and then it all just you know gets worse and worse. Once you know exactly how much you're worth, then you can move forward. Uh, you know you need to create a budget, a daily budget. Uh, you need to actually work out what am I if you if you're able to am I able to afford a house? Is this sort of some way that I can buy a house on my income? Uh, and I work with a mortgage broker. I work with everyone involved in the divorce and separation process, so they can help you as much as possible. So KiwiSaver, you know, can I take my KiwiSaver out to use as part of my deposit? for example. People have got to remember until that um, settlement agreement is signed, you're still like you're married. So you've got joint accounts, you've got, um, you know, a, a house together, you've got debt, you know, you're both going to be responsible for that debt. So the last thing you want to do is go wild on the credit card. Uh, so making sure that you keep a limit on how much you spend on your credit card, keeping an eye on all of your other expenses, close any joint accounts, uh, all those sort of things that you need to do so you can move forward. 
it's really important to actually get some financial advice with a financial advisor. You can even speak to your solicitor in the first instance. You know, your, your solicitor might, if, if it's high conflict, you might have to get your, you might have to get your lawyer to freeze accounts, um, put a caveat on a property being sold. All these sort of things. Obviously, everyone's scenario is so different. I tell my clients before you decide to leave a marriage. I've got a document, 10 things you need to do before you leave a marriage. And one of those things is actually have a nest egg, whether you're able to uh, get some money from an account or whether you can borrow some money from family or friends because you're going to need a nest egg, particularly if you haven't been working. Um, hence why I talked about earlier, actually always having your toe or your foot in the door in relation to work in some way. It's really, really important. Uh, so you've got to make a plan moving forward. What is my future going to look like? Am I going to rent? Is it, yeah, is it more cost effective for me to rent? Is it more cost effective, particularly at the moment, for example, with the lo um, low interest rates, although house prices are, are high? Insane. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. All, so all of those sort of things. Um, child support, how much am I entitled to? Have I got 50% custody? Go to the IRD. Um, online and you can work out an assessment there. You've got to have your obviously your ex-partner's um, tax returns to work that out. Um, starting again, yeah, you're starting again. So what chattels are you going to be taking from your marriage? We've got a chattels inventory that we give to our clients and fill that out. Make sure that you, I want that auntie's vase or I want the grand piano or though that artwork is, is mine, I brought that into the relationship. Mm. It's really, it's a job getting divorced and separated and you need to do it properly. Have you got a will? Mm. You need a new will. Yeah. All of these things need to be considered and you just want to maximise, in terms of the financial part of it, you want to maximise you know, you you want to maximise what you get out of the relationship. I say to my clients, if you come out slightly unhappy with your settlement agreement, the result of that, then that's a good deal. How now can you create financial freedom to you, for yourself? You've got a job. Can you do more hours? I want to I want to set up a business. What's that going to look like? Yeah. How am I going to look after my children? How am I going to look after myself? Self-care is really important. What's my identity now? What's my purpose as I move forward into a completely different life that I may have had for 20 years? All of these factors have got to be considered. Your financial, your legal, your parenting, uh, and your new beginnings and your future. Mm. All of which is doable. It's just making yeah. sure that you get it there in the best way that you can. Hey, thank you so much. That's Bridget Jackson from Equal Access. Now